take a seat. Find Genesis chapter 28 in your Bibles. And this is going to be the question of the hour. Did the catechism question make it to the slides? It did not. Oh, you guys are off the hook then this morning. They're smiling now. Look at them out there. Yes, we don't have to do the question this morning. But if you have your bulletin, it's actually in print there as well. So we can at least mention it this morning because the catechism question would be so upset if we did not make mention of it this morning. So that question is simply this. How is the word, the Bible, God's word, to be read and heard with my ears that it may become effectual to salvation? Hmm. Good question. I'm glad you asked me. That the word may become effectual to salvation, we must attend thereunto with diligence, preparation and prayer, receive it in faith and love, lay it up in our hearts and practice it in our lives. I love the phrase, lay it up in our hearts. Have you ever seen a cow... This is gross. I'm going to ruin your lunch. Have you ever seen a cow reach you its cud? No. Now you got to go up on a farm. You know when they eat and they eat and they eat and all of a sudden they then, they vomit it up. And then they, like a dog, they re-eat it. And I know it's gross, isn't it? I understand. Um, but it's the idea of getting the more nutrients out of it to suck everything they can get out of that Stuff they ate. Well, the Bible's sort of not like vomit, but the Bible's the Word of God, and you are to regurgitate it. You are to eat it and just let it roll over in your, your mind and your heart so you can benefit from it. I just ruined your lunch, didn't I? Well, that's okay. That's all right. That's okay. We need a little, little less. Okay, Bible verse should be behind me. Does it say First Peter, Second Peter 3.18 back there? Not yet? Now? See, there you go. You ask, you ask, and you will receive. And it happens. Um, we are to grow, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Not grow taller, not grow the other proportion. We are to grow in the grace. God, if you're a Christian, you are to grow in the grace and knowledge. Not in the law, you are to grow in the grace. We're not talking about growing in the law, performing more rules, more hoops to jump through. We're not talking about all the don'ts. Don't, 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 don't. I know there's some things we're not supposed to do as believers. I get that. But there's a whole lot more do's. Do this. Do this. Do this. Worship me. Enjoy me. Delight in me. Serve me. Be part of my people. Engage with me. Oh, and love me. George Swinock. Ever hear him before? He's a favorite author, huh? George Swinock. He's from the 1600s. One of my Puritan guys I had to read when I was in school. He wrote this. Satan watches for those vessels that sail without a convoy. You know what he's talking about? Satan watches for those vessels that, that journey or sail without a convoy. He looks for those who claim to be Jesus' people, but try to do it on their own. He looks for them. Why? Oh, because they're easy targets. He can discourage them. How we grow in grace, in the sphere of grace and knowledge, is by understanding the depth of not just what God has done, but the depth of who He is. He's God infinite, beyond words, immeasurable. You could never add to Him. He's God. He, there is no shadow of change within Him. I grow as a believer in my heart as I begin to grow in the grace and the understanding of who I'm going to meet one day when I close my eyes in death. And the death drew, uh, dew grows cold on my brow. I'm going to see God as He is face to face. Are you ready for that? I'm kind of ready. And then sometimes not kind of ready, okay? I've never walked that way before. 
I've watched many of our loved ones go that way, but I haven't walked that way before. So I want to grow in grace, in the grace and the knowledge. Today we're talking about growing years. And our characters that we meet today, which we've met already, Isaac, Jacob, and Esau, two of them are growing. And I wonder why he's not doing so good because God's letting him go the way he wants to go. Let's read the Word of God. This is uh, Genesis 28, just 1 through 9, first book of your Bible. I know you can find it without the electronic things helping us. Um, Genesis 28, 1 through 9. So Isaac called Jacob and blessed him. And charged him and said to him, You shall not take a wife from the daughters of Canaan. Arise, go to Padan Aram, to the house of Bethuel, your, mother, your mother's father, and from there take to yourself a wife from the daughters of Laban, your mother's brother. And son, may God Almighty bless you. And make you fruitful and multiply you, that you may become a company of peoples. May he also give you the blessing of Abraham. To you and to your descendants with you, that you may possess the land of your sojournings, which God gave to Abraham. And then Isaac sent Jacob away, and he went to Padah Aram, to Laban, son of Bethuel, the Aramean, the brother of Rebekah, the mother of Jacob and Esau. Now Esau saw that Isaac had blessed Jacob and sent him away to Padah Aram to take himself a wife from there. And that when he blessed him, he charged him, saying, You shall not take a wife from the daughters of the Canaan. And that Jacob had obeyed his father and his mother and had gone to Padah Aram. So Esau saw that the daughters of Canaan displeased his father Isaac. And Esau went to Ishmael. And married besides the wives that he had had, Mahalath, the daughter of Ishmael, Abraham's son, the sister of Nabaioth. That is the word of God. Let's pray. Lord, we've come to this place, hopeful to meet with you, to see Jesus this morning in the word. And so we ask for this undeserved grace to be given to us that you would be revealed to us more fully in all your wonder and all your praise. We ask in your holy name. Amen. Nobody, and I mean nobody on the planet, will be right with God, find a rightness with God through their own individual performance. Always by grace. Always by the finished work of Jesus Christ. I get right with God, not because of my goodness, but because I lay my chips on Jesus and Jesus alone for my right standing with God. And yet, though my good works will not establish that relationship, God is still going to work something in me, which is called good works, to the praise of his Glorious grace. Those good works are not the foundation, but they are the result of a rightness with God. And those works will be wrapped around the concept of love. Love is described in the Bible. Not the idea of love that was promoted in our day back in the 60s where it says, Hello, I love you. Why don't you tell me your name? That's not love. That's not biblical love. Biblical love is long-suffering. Willing to endure for the good of the other. And it starts in a sense with God. That I am to love God with all my whole heart, soul, strength, and mind. To love Him. To love Him for who He is and what He's done for me. And then to love my neighbor as myself. In other words, my good works are going to surround wanting more of God. Wanting more of Christ. I have Christ. Christ has me. And therefore, I want more Christ. I need to have him more each day. I need to find him. I need to see his face when the world slaps me in the face. Anybody here slapped in the face this week? Anybody? We can slap you if you'd like us to, okay? We'll take care of that for you. When, he slap, when the world slaps you in the face, I, the Christian says, I need more of Christ. I need more of my Lord. My good works are going to surround this concept of love, loving God and Loving others in the name of my Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. But who gets to decide what good works look like? Can I make that up on my own? Have my own version of good works? 
Well, our confession of faith, Baptist Confession of 1689 says this, Good works are only such as God has commanded in His holy word. So the good works that He's working in me, if He's working good works in me, should be regulated by the book. The book will tell me what good works are supposed to look like. I just can't make things up and say, this is a good work. I, Pastor Steve, did this, therefore God will see it as a good work. It doesn't work that way. God tells us in the Bible what good works will look like. So as I grow in grace and in the knowledge, those good works will become more of reality in my life. Let me use a story from the Old Testament that sounded like a good work at first and then didn't turn out to be a good work after all. You guys over here, you're going to be the Philistines. So put your Philistine faces on. Oh, that'll work. Don't worry about it. Philistines, you guys stole the Ark of the Covenant that was over here. And the Israelites, bad people. And it went all the way over here. The Ark of the Covenant being that visible picture of the presence of God amongst his children. And that didn't really work good for you guys. Because everything went downhill in your country or culture as soon as the ark arrived because you didn't believe in the God of Yahweh. And so you guys sent it back over to Israel. And so King David said, you know, <clears throat> I'd like to have that ark. The ark ended up laying in someone's field and uh, the Philistines had sent it back on a cart with oxen. And so David said, you know something? I think the ark belongs back in Jerusalem where it's supposed to be. And so um, we're going to go get it. And so David had a good idea. This was going to be a good, a good work. I'm going to build a fresh cart. Never carried nothing on it before. Because God deserves that, right? Isn't that a good idea? Just shake your head, no. <laughs> and then we're going to get some fresh oxen who have never ever pulled a cart before. That, that's going to honor God, right? That'll be a good work. And so they, they get the, the fresh cart, the fresh oxen, and they're, they're moving the Ark of the Covenant, and it hits one of those New England potholes. You know, and bump, and the whole cart begins to shake, and, and Uzzah, up there with Ohio, is up there, and he reaches out because the Ark's going to fall off. And it's a good idea to, to steady it, right? Because you don't want the Ark overflowing, and, and so he touches the Ark. And what happens? He dies. I mean, they were celebrating. If, if you could audibly hear this, the music's playing, people are dancing, all of a sudden, hmm, and it's quiet. I mean, it's quiet. No one's making a sound, and there's a dead guy on the ground. And what looked like a good work was not a good work anymore. Then David was really angry, the Bible says. The king was angry with God, and then David found out why this happened. He realized that when we move the Ark of the Covenant, we listen to God's word, not our words. The Levites carry the Ark on poles through little ringlets on the side of the Ark. And when David did it that way, guess what happened? The Ark made it back to where it was supposed to be. God determines what a good work is. In our blind zeal, we don't get to say, oh, this is a good work. Our good works are regulated, but as we grow in grace... As we go into truth, those things will become alive in our life. Because Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2, that though we're not saved by our works, he has prepared us for them, which he prepared long beforehand for us to walk in them. Keep that in mind. Okay, two promises in Genesis I want to keep your mind of before we jump into the characters. First of all, to Abraham. Big promise. Abraham can be father of nations, sand of the sea, stars of the heaven. Your descendants are going to outnumber them all. That promise is still on the table, though it's not really showing itself quite as yet. And then he's given a promise or a word to Isaac through Rebekah that when your two boys get older, the older is going to serve the younger. That's what's going to happen. Remember their birth? Esau comes out first, and old Jacob's got a hold of his heel, holding on. And the word to Rebekah was, I know that's the birth order, but that's not going to be the order in the world, the, the older is going to serve the younger. And remember that Isaac didn't really like that. And so Isaac was trying to give the blessing to Esau instead, even though God's word said that. And that's what we're going to look at in a second. Our doctrine this morning is this. Good works are only those works done in Christ as commanded in his word. Period. 
Grow in grace, my friend. Grow in the knowledge of God, but grow in the scripture, understanding what a good work would be. First of all, our first point is Isaac's growth is realized. Do you realize, that, remember the story when he gave the blessing to Jacob, who was disguised, and then Jacob left. This, this would make a great movie, by the way. And, and Jacob gets out, and like two seconds later, Esau comes so I don't know if it was seconds. Esau comes in, and then he asks for the blessing, and Isaac just freaks out. You know what the, the verse actually says? He trembled violently. Isaac trembled violently. What has happened? What I think probably took place is that at that moment, Isaac realized that God stepped in and took care of business. Because Isaac wasn't following the revealed truth of God's word. And so in verse 1, we have Isaac calling Jacob. And it's silent about what took place. I mean, Jacob pulled a fast one on his father, didn't he? He played him. That's the name of Jacob. He's a supplanter. That's what he does. He played his father Isaac, and Isaac says nothing about it. I mean, if I was Isaac, I would have said, you little brat. Playing on my blindness? What's wrong with you? Trying to steal this away like that? What is your problem, son? But nothing like that. Everything is silent. I don't want to build an argument on silence, but wow, it's got to be really large there. Because if I'm Isaac, I'm going to slap him around. Are he going to feel my pain because my own son deceived me? My own son played me like this? Are you kidding me? And Isaac calls for Jacob to bless him. Isaac, I have to believe, has come to grips that it's best to follow the will of God. I know that Esau is my favorite. He hunts. He's a man's man. He's a monster. I mean, he's great. You know, and Jacob, he's kind of in the kitchen, you know, playing chef. But this is what God has said. God has said that the older will serve the younger. Therefore, the younger needs the blessing in order to be the one who leads the family. He's come to grips with that. He's not relying upon his own wishes, his own wants. It's no longer about Isaac. It's about the truth. And he begins to show that he's growing in the grace and the knowledge. I don't know what struck Isaac. Maybe that moment hit. The Holy Spirit used something, but... What does God use for you in your life to kind of wake you up to say, you know something? I better start paying attention to some of these things. Edward Griffin, I think I've used this illustration before, he actually pastored for a short time at Park Street in Boston. When he was studying to go into the ministry, he decided not to. He was going to become a lawyer. And he kind of walked away from the things of God. And while he was walking away from the things of God, he got really, really, really sick one day. And his thoughts began to trouble him. And Edward Griffin said these words. He said to himself, if I can't handle the pains of this sickness just for a few days and weeks, how in the world am I ever going to deal with the pains of hell forever? And that's what the Holy Spirit used in his life to begin to change him. And he gave his heart back to the Lord, left the lawyer study and went back into the ministry and he became a pastor for many years. What changed Jonah? Remember the revealed will for Jonah? Jonah, get up and go to Nineveh and tell those people that you hate with a deep, deep hatred, tell them that I'm going to come and wipe them out in 40 days. And what does Jonah say? Eh, not me. I'm never going there. And you can't make me no matter what you do. So what changed him? Well, God did. God had a fish waiting for him, just for him and him alone. What does God provide you in your life that you become like Isaac and realize, you know something? God's will needs to be done. I love the fact that it's Isaac who calls Jacob. Isaac could have played the I'm hurt card. I'm hurt. I'm not talking to him. He hurt me. He played me. He made me look like a fool. 
I'm not talking to him. I don't feel right about this. I'm the hurt one. Or I'm more right than him. Don't you love when you, you, you stay on the island of I'm right? You're over here and your significant other's over here. I'm right. I'm right. We're all just right, right? Somebody's going to get off the island of I'm right and jump in the ocean to say it doesn't really matter. Isaac mans up and says, you know something? Jacob, come back to me. How do you think Jacob felt? He knew what he did. He played his dad. He played his brother. And Isaac calls him. Isaac is maturing. He's growing in grace. And he calls his son to bless him. And he takes the first step. He could have played the card, oh, I'm hurt. Can, can I tell you something? I'm going to tell you anyways, right? Exactly. Everybody's hurting. Okay? Everybody. Some with this, some with that, some more deeply this week, some more deeply next week. But everybody's hurting. Okay? Isaac mans up and says, you know something? It's time to make this right again. And he calls. He takes the step. He takes the first step. He's growing in grace. And he gives such clear, clear counsel. He wants to do everything for Jacob that he can to make sure Jacob will spiritually prosper and he will be a blessing to God's people. Don't take a wife from the people here. Go back to your mother's people who are connected to Abraham's brother and find a wife back there. Then you will prosper. You can be that person. Clear, clear counsel so they can prosper. He can prosper. I like getting old some, in some ways. It's kind of fun. Because I, I look back and, and my, my former kids who are now in their 40s and they're older than I was when I was teaching them way back when in the Ark Stone Age, but they'll tell me stuff that I said to them. And I think, oh, I said that to you? <laughs> Sounds like me, I guess. And, and what they appreciated was the fact is they said, you know, we like the clear counsel. One, one kid told me this. I remember you saying this to me, that when you get a, a note from somebody as a teenager that, you really care, that really cares about you or you care about them, don't you go back and reread re it all over again? Remember those days? You get that card from that special person and you, you keep reading it. And then I said... This is the card. Read it over. They remember that clear counsel. Then I remember one student said to me recently that, uh, I remember you saying this, Pastor Steve. You said that if we didn't have a hunger for the living God in Christ, if we didn't want to be with him and spend time with him, then we were just playing religion. Because if we have Jesus, Jesus has us, and we want more Jesus. And they said, I appreciate the clear counsel, Pastor. Isaac, don't go there for a wife. Clear counsel. I want you to prosper. I want you to listen. And Isaac is growing in grace. And then he brings out the big guns. He brings out Abraham. He blesses him again. Did the first blessing not stick? Remember last chapter, he blessed them. And was it because of false pretenses? It wasn't going to work now? Why did he have to bless him again? I think it's more for Jacob than it is for Isaac. I think Jacob needs to hear this now, not in the context of uh, deception, but in the context of truth. And he brings out Abraham, the heavy guns, and says, here is the promise on the table. And now it's going to Abraham. Now it's gone through me, Isaac, your father. And now, Jacob, it's going to go through you as well. Because that's what God has said. And he's convinced. I wonder if Abraham... Or I wonder if Isaac ever told his son Jacob about the time when granddaddy Abraham took him up to the mountain when he was 12 years old. Hey, son, remember, I can tell you the story about what granddaddy did to me one time. We were out camping, long way away from home. I went to this mountain and, uh, and uh, granddaddy said that I was going to be the sacrifice. <laughs> and your Isaac telling your son this, Jacob's eyes probably are that big. We don't know if this actually happened, but I always wonder about that. And... Uh, but then as soon as he lifted up the knife, the angel called and said, stop. And now I know that you trust me. You see, because you can trust his word, Jacob. The word I'm passing on to you. I'm blessing you right now. You can trust that word. Isn't that, that word, the hymn says that? It says, 
What more can he say than to you he has said? To you who for refuge to Jesus have fled. What more can he say than to you that he said? If you believe in me, you have eternal life. Trust in me. And you'll always, always know me. Walk with me. Follow me. Let my spirit work in your heart and produce those good works. Grow a present imperative command. Keep growing always in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus. You know, Isaac blesses his son. And you see the growth taking place in his life. Secondly, how about Jacob? A little more shortly here. Jacob's simple obedience. It seems like a trivial thing, but you know how far he's going to travel to go back home? He's going to go about 500 plus miles by himself, traveling to his brother, his, his, his mother's life. It's going to be hard. You know, it's, it's a relational priority, and, and, and Isaac is really concerned that Jacob, don't take one of these ladies here, and I'm sure there's plenty around, but I want you to go back home. It's one of those things that it's going to have a lot of fingers, so children, singles, as you think about marriage, um, make sure you choose wisely. Remember Solomon? I mean, Solomon was a brainiac, wasn't he? What a geek, I and mean, he was so smart. He knew everything. But his, his great brains couldn't stop his brain from becoming mush when it came to all those people that he married that stole his heart away to false gods. So be careful who you decide to marry. Let your parents have a few words to say about those kind of things. Um, let the fifth commandment take place in your life because Esau, Esau will not be that way, but Jacob, he'll listen. And, and Jacob will have to go through hardship in this act of obedience, of growing in grace. Because sometimes following Jesus is not going to be easy. I'm not here to tell you it is going to be easy. Sometimes following Christ is going to be hard. You're going to have to make a hard decision sometimes. And you're not going to like the moment. But, like Jacob, this simple act of obedience can make all the difference in the world. How about this simple act of obedience? He commands us to be baptized, doesn't he? Be baptized. Simple. Are you baptized? Well, if not, get baptized. We'll gladly do it for you. You get to meet with me, which is certainly a joy of joys, right? What more could you ask for? Um, and give, It's simple. Just, just get baptized. Jesus, we talked about this in, on Wednesday nights. Christ says, if you're going to follow me, I want you to deny yourself, pick up your cross daily, and then follow me. Because you can't follow me until, first of all, you deny yourself and then pick up your cross. Then you can follow me, but not until. And I have to love that. We taught that class on messy grace. And I love the, the people who spoke, who confessed that some of their temptation as believers, and before they were in Christ, was same-sex attraction. And since they struggled with same-sex attraction, they believed the gospel call was for them to deny themselves that reality, that impulse, like Christ denied himself and follow Jesus. Like we all have to in various ways in various places. I really love that idea of denying myself. Here, here's Jacob, I'm going to go. I know some self-preservation might be there because Brother Esau is really, really ticked at me. But I'm going to go all the way to those people to find a wife. And I'm simply going to obey my parents. It's that simple. Grow in the grace and the knowledge of Christ Jesus the Lord. Jacob is growing. He's not done growing yet. He's got 20 years in the school of Christ to go before he comes back home. Finally, Esau's misguided religion. Oh my goodness, Esau, what is happening here? Do you read the text? It said that Esau saw that the wives around Canaan displeased his parents. He saw that Jacob was sent away. So what does Esau do? Hmm. My two wives displease my parents. 
Jacob got the blessing by then going to a, a place where our parents have told him to go that's not from the wives of Canaan. So I'm going to kind of put my wife, uh, wives aside and I'm going to do the makeup wife. I'm going to get a wife that's going to allow me to get the blessing from my parents. See the game he's playing here? Hebrews tells us this about Jake, uh, Esau. For you know that even after this, when Esau desired to inherit the blessing, he continually, he continually desired over and over again to play a game to try to get the blessing from his father. And that's a game right now for him. I'll, I'll poke at shoes, and I know, I know those wives that I have right now really displease my parents, but it appears if I go after a different kind of wife, might be, at least it's tied to Abraham this time, Ishmael, then, then they'll, I'll get the blessing. What we have here is we have a little game that he plays. That Esau, his religion is, I'll pick and choose from Yahweh the things I like, but the rest of it will be my version of religion. I'm not going to surrender all to Christ or surrender all to Yahweh. No, I will do my thing the way I think I should. It'll be religion according to my version. Does that ever work, by the way? Jesus according to me? It never works. Never will. I'll call it this, but a lot of our evangelicalism is more like an Esauism, where I say I want to believe in Jesus because I don't want to have the fear of hell. Heavens, no. Don't want to have the fear of hell. So I'll believe in Jesus, but Jesus, my time, my money, and my body are mine. I do with what I want when I want to, period. So hands off, pal. That's not the Bible's version of following Jesus. The Bible's version of following Jesus is this. Isaac Watts, if the whole realm of nature were mine, all the mountains, Himalayas, the Rockies, Mount Everest, all the oceans, if all the whole realm of nature was mine, that would be a present far too small to give back to God for what he's done for me in Jesus. Because love so amazing, so divine, demands what? My soul, my life, my all. Not just pick here, pick there, and give God what I think he desires. He wants everything. Whatever you ask, Lord, I want to obey you. Go back in time. Go back to the late, late, late 1980s. Sounds long ago, doesn't it? The 1980s. Wow. At my ordination service, I had this song sung by Steve Camp, singer-songwriter, Christian singer-songwriter, Steve Camp. It's called, Whatever You Ask. And it goes like this. Lord, whatever you ask, I want to obey you. To let my life beat with a servant's heart. Lord, whatever you ask, I know that you'll give me wisdom and courage to equal the task. Lord, whatever you ask. That's growing in grace. The grace and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's not holding things back and say, Jesus, hands off. Hands off my money. Hands off my time. Hands off my body. I'll come every once in a while to worship. So the fact that I won't have the fear of hell, but really, I'm not going to commit my life to you. That's Esauism. I'll do a little bit to gain some kind of earthly prestige, earthly possessions, to get the blessing from my dad. That's what my brother did. That seemed to work for him. I'll do the same thing, and then I'll be... No, he doesn't get it. It's not about earthly possession, earthly prestige, earthly ease. Esau, it's about following God with all your whole heart, soul, strength, and mind. I've been doing this for a long time. I'm going to retire someday. You do realize that, right? I am going to retire. I'm going to have to. The old bod's going to give out, and uh, that's going to be it for me. I'm, David's shaking his head, no. I'm just going to check out and say, ah, Lord, take me home. But um, I've been doing this for 35 years. And the, and the people that I've met who have given their whole heart to the Lord have done so well. Oh, they've done well. They, they have followed, and they've died well. They've died well in the Lord. And those who wanted to play like Esau, I'll do a little bit here, a little bit there, but the rest of it's mine, didn't do so well. you got to grow. It's a present, active imperative. Right, Cesar? Present, active imperative. That's Greek for, it's always a command every moment of every day. You always are growing in the grace and the knowledge of Jesus Christ. How do you do that? 
Well, remember George Swinock? Satan looks for those vessels who like to travel or sail without a convoy. You can't do it without, your, without each other. You've got to be here. There are so many times to be fed to know more about God's Word. There's ladies' supper. There's ladies' Bible study. There's ladies' prayer time. There is men's breakfast. There is men's Bible study. There's men's lunch. We're great, granted, we just eat, but it's kind of fun still. Um, we have a good time. Then there's Sunday morning worship. There is Wednesday night where we go through the Gospel of Luke. Then there is Sunday school in the morning for. There's all kinds of time to grow in the grace and the sphere of grace and the knowledge of Christ. So you're growing. Now you have to take advantage of those times. It's up to you. It's all right here. God has opened up heaven's paradise, heaven's doors for you to learn about him, who he is, and to get to know one another in a very, very intimate way, to grow in grace. Well, I'll leave you with this. If, um, if we were trying to go to a camp, and I was going to meet you there, and then I asked you the directions how to get there, and you couldn't tell me how to get to the camp, how high is my confidence level that you're going to be there? Not very, right? If you can't tell me how to be right with God in some sort of language, how to be forgiven, how to be right standing with Him because of what Jesus... If you can't tell me any of that, what's my confidence level that you're going to be there? Not going to be very high, is it? So you've got to grow in the grace and in the knowledge, the sphere of grace, not rules or law, the sphere of grace and the knowledge of our our loving Savior, and then you'll be growing. The growing years. How many are still growing? i got so long to go. I'm not there yet. Still in the school of Christ. But God be praised. It's grace unmeasured that he grants us every day. Let's pray. God, thank you for the word. Help us to understand it, to grow in it, to love it, and to just really desire to see your hand work in our lives. Thank you for your faithfulness to Isaac and Jacob. And Lord, help us to follow you as you deserve to be followed. We pray in your holy name. Amen.